So recently, and by recently I mean this morning, I was scrolling through TikTok, and while I was in this infinite scroll trying to not get out of bed, I came across a video, an edit, of Merowem's speech that he gave to Netero. Now, for those of you who have followed the page for a while, you'll know that Hunter x Hunter is my favorite anime of all time. And for those of you who have followed the page a little bit longer, you'll know that Merowem is my favorite character from my favorite anime. Which is why I would say that Merowem is probably my favorite character in anime Ever. And because Meruem is my favorite character in anime ever, and because I'm the way that I am, I've taken it onto myself to do deep character dives into Meruem as a whole every time I've watched Hunter x Hunter, of which there's been seven or eight times. And because I'm so intrigued with the story of his character and the motivations of his character, and because I've consumed so much Hunter x Hunter media, I believe that I have a better understanding of who he is as a character than a lot of people. That's not me trying to brag. If anything, it's kind of embarrassing. I've watched Hunter x Hunter way too many times. However, because I feel like I have this incredibly intimate understanding of what Meruem's motivations are and the lesson that he's supposed to teach us throughout the medium of Hunter x Hunter, it's weird for me to see other people's interpretation of what they believe Meruem stood for. And it's even weirder for me to see people resonate with his ideology. See, Meruem isn't my favorite character because I believe that the vision he had for the world was the correct one. See, Meruem is my favorite anime character of all time because I believe he was misguided. He held the hope and optimism of a child because that's what he was. Without taking a second to take into account real world consequences and how difficult and bloody it would be to enact his version of the world. And that's the beauty of his character. It's underdeveloped. He's only had two or three life experiences. To see people in the comments of this video wishing that Netero had lost and that Meruem had taken over the world is perplexing. But I think it comes from a lack of information, a lack of understanding of what Meruem's character was supposed to represent. Which is why today, I want to talk about my favorite anime character ever. Today, I want to do a you know nothing about Meruem. This is a video I've wanted to make for a very long time, so I'm very excited about it. But before we get into this very exciting video, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, hit that noti bell. And if you like hearing me talk about the things I'm passionate about, go ahead and follow my brand new anime podcast that I'm doing with Danny Mata called Utaku's Anonymous. We break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So before we get into all that, guys, today I want to talk to you about a brand new sponsor to the page, Skillshare. Skillshare is one of the greatest collective bases of knowledge on the entirety of the internet. You may know they have classes on photography and film and video editing. But did you know they have classes for way more than just that? They have hundreds of career-focused classes as well. And this year is the perfect time to reinvent yourself and your goals. Traditional 9-to-5 jobs are not a one-size-fit-all. And with the help of Skillshare, you can learn how to design a career perfectly tailored to your skill set. Or you can adapt your skill set to allow you to have more tools in your tool belt to get you those interviews and those jobs you want. So the beauty of Skillshare is that everybody has a different goal in mind when joining it. See, personally, when I was first starting out in content creation, Skillshare helped me massively. I wanted to learn how to be more productive and manage my time better and also start a creative career. And believe it or not, I found classes perfectly suited to helping me in those goals as I took classes in productivity and time management. And these classes taught me how to maximize the hours in my day to be the most productive and efficient version of myself. These productivity classes made me realize that exercise is what gets my brain going. Therefore, I always get at least a small work out in before I sit down to film. But I wanted to take my knowledge one step further than that, which is why I took a class in how to build a creative career, which taught me to leverage my strengths. Everybody who wants to start a creative career is creative, but the millions of bits of information that you've picked up during your unique life builds you a path into a creative career. And today you guys can start down your own path to betterment through knowledge. As the first 1,000 people to click the link in my description will get a free one month trial of Skillshare, where you can peruse the entirety of Skillshare class library completely free. It's time that we redefine what work means to us and accomplish the goal that we've been trying to this year with a free trial to Skillshare. An intelligent weeb is a dangerous weeb. So Meruem, the king of the Chimera ants, the pinnacle of evolution, the strongest ant bore from the Chimera Queen, her truest masterpiece, a B-level threat according to the Hunter Association that was strong enough to kill the strongest hunter on Earth. Netero. There was only two people on Earth who were believed to be able to kill Meruem before he was exposed to the Rose, and that would be Prime Netero and Transformed Go. However, unfortunately, neither of these people would ever get to fight against Meruem because Isaac was significantly beyond his prime and Gon was killing Pita. Meruem was only alive for 40 
days. Yet in those 40 days, he undergoes more character development than almost every single anime manga character in existence. See, a lot of people that watch Hunter x Hunter for the first time get to the Chimera Ant season and drop Hunter x Hunter because the pacing of the Chimera Ant arc significantly slows down comparatively to the likes of Greed Island. But what we get in a replacement for battles is building, and specifically world building and character building. While Merom isn't actually born until episode 91, which is almost 20 episodes into the Chimera Ant arc, a lot of that heavy weight of the character development building falls on his shoulders. See, Merom had an incredibly far way to develop. He was born maniacal, cruel, and violent, ripping himself out of his mother's womb because he didn't want to be incubated any longer, killing her in the process. See, the ideologies of his own mother had seeped into his body. The queen was determined to give birth to the perfect offspring, the offspring that would lead all of the Chimera Ants to be the primary life force on Earth. And that ideology, much in the same way that the meals the queen was eating were created creating Merowem in her stomach, created Merowem in her stomach. Merowem was born haughty and prideful, and from the moment of his birth, considered himself to be the superior life form on Earth, feeling no concern for anybody around him as everyone below him was basically a non-living being, including his mother, who his own birth killed. And this ideology extended to more than just his mother. Merowem didn't believe he was just above all humans, he believed he was above all Chimera Ants. Any Chimera Ant he deemed as disrespectful, he would kill and cannibalize. But what Merom didn't realize is that he had a Nen ability called Nen Synthesis, an ability that allowed him to use the techniques of anybody whose body he eats so long as they have Nen techniques. And while Merom was in his mother's stomach, she had eaten somebody with Nen abilities, and he had fallen in love with this taste. However, Merom didn't know what Nen was, or the fact that he loved the taste of it. And therefore, for the moment of his birth, he simply viewed all all humans as farm animals that were meant for him to slaughter and eat. Well, the first human he ever ate being a child. You know, when you start with eating children, you got a long climb up to being a likable character. Or not, if you don't like kids. But the murder of this child for sustenance was actually just murder. As Merowem, after eating them, spit out their flesh, as the taste didn't compare to eating somebody with Nen. And while obviously watching Merowem murder two parents and their child, and then eat them and then spit out their flesh is a lot to take in. One of the most interesting aspects of this scene is the fact that Merowem remarks on the fact that they didn't fight back. And this perplexes Merowem because he believed that humans were violent creatures who would identify him as a threat immediately. And yet these humans simply stood there and were murdered by him. Which does two things to Merowem. One, it sees the ideology in Merowem's brain that humans are livestock, simply existing until they're murdered. And two, that humans possibly may not be as violent or vitriol as he believed them to be originally. Seeding the idea in his head that humans may actually be beyond his initial calculations. However, what's truly horrific about this entire scene is that Merowem knows that eating these people won't taste good. See, Merom has an encounter with Pito after he tries to eat these three people, where Pito tries to tell him that these rare humans admit aura, and that the taste of that aura is what he enjoys. However, after Pito tries to tell him this, Merom strikes them, with the intention of killing them, but Pito is obviously too strong to die in one strike. It's at this point that it's revealed to us that Merom knows not only how to see aura, but also that aura is what he's looking for, meaning that this version of Merom killed this family, fully knowing that they probably wouldn't taste good, and that he probably wouldn't eat them. And it really isn't until Merowem and his royal guards break into the royal palace of East Scorto that Merowem finally gets to eat a rare human. He gets that delicacy when he gets to eat the head of security of the royal palace, who, by the looks of him, is an enhancer. And upon eating the body of this most likely enhancer, Merowem is not only very excited, but also gains his Nen abilities, which is probably why Merowem ends up being an enhancer. However, ironically, this isn't even the most character-forming thing that happens to Merowem in the royal palace. See, after killing the enhancer who was the head of security, Merowem and the royal guards go to the throne room. And in there, they find the leader of East Gorto, Minjol Eek. It's Kim Jong-un. And this Kirkland brand, Kim Jong-un, threatens Merowem and his royal guards, telling them to get out. But it's at this point that Merowem is disappointed because he doesn't see any aura off of this dictator. And it's revealed to him that humans don't elect their leaders based on strength. But instead, sometimes they elect their leaders based on bloodlines or popularity or who has the most money. And Merowem believes that humans allowing themselves to be led by idiots is the reason he needs to put them on a short leash. He then proceeds to kill the dictator and have Pito reanimate his corpse so they can use him. But in the dictator's 
dictator's throne room, there was also dancers. And these dancers, upon seeing the dictator be murdered, plead for their lives. And it's at this point that we get a really good look into Merowim's current ideology about humans. As these dancers plead for their lives, Merowim just laughs, telling them if they listen to the pleas of the swine and the cattle that they slaughter, fully acknowledging the ideology that he believes that humans are livestock. And because humans show no mercy to the livestock that they keep, why should he? And honestly, at this current moment, I couldn't necessarily fault you with siding with the ideologies of Meroweb. From his perspective, he was a superior being to humans, much in the same capacity that we view ourselves as superior beings to cows or pigs or fish. And while you may say that the difference between us and cows and fish and pigs is consciousness, the ability to do math and pay taxes, implying that consciously we are a superior being to the livestock that we eat, Meroweb considered himself to be a superior life force consciously to humans. So while obviously I don't condone him killing people and eating them, at the end of the day, he can't be faulted for his ideology, as he was born with the preconceived notion that he was the most superior life form on Earth. However, Merowim wasn't okay with just the occasional meal. Merowim wanted to use the palace courtyards of East Gorto as a meat orchard, and therefore he manipulated the corpse of the now dead dictator to bring the entirety of East Gorto's population to the royal palace, where he would brutally awaken the entire population to Nen so they could either be high quality food or turned into Nen using soldiers. And then after Meroem achieved a certain amount of soldiers and a certain amount of strength, he would unify the entirety of the world under his fist. Now, he never necessarily strays from this idea, though the logic in the reasoning behind that idea changes as Meroem changes. See, while Meroem does go through a massive amount of character development, one thing stays the same, and that one thing is pride. I believe that Meroem is actually the perfect character study when talking about pride, because there are a million different kinds of pride. There's being haughty, there's being gaudy, there's being confident, and there's being delusional. Throughout Meroem's character arc, he is every single one of these things, and that is genuinely one of the most fascinating things about him. See, Meroem, upon becoming the new leader of East Corto, is haughty. He's overly confident. He believes that his power will be enough to take over the entire world. And he wants to do that for his own good. He has no ulterior motives to his world domination. He believes that humans are an inferior race and therefore they should be under his boot. But this is where Meroem begins to undergo change. See, Meroem already understands that he is incredibly powerful physically, but Meroem also has the incredible ability to teach himself basically anything he needs to know in much faster than any human alive could ever pull off, which is what played into his ideology that he was a greater conscious being than human. Because for all intents and purposes, he was just smarter. So as a selection was going on, Meroem was honing his intellect, reading books, gaining the massive knowledge of humanity. And when he had read every single book in the Royal Palace, he switched to strategy board games in order to hone his strategy thinking for future wars to come. He begins with chess and beats the national chess champion. He moves on to Shoji and beats the national Shoji champion. He then learns Go and beats the national Go champion. And every single time Meroem is mastering these games faster and faster and faster, mastering Go and half the time he mastered Shoji, becoming disappointed with these national champions killing them when they bore him until eventually he's introduced to Gunji. Gunji? Gunji? Ah, whatever, it's a fake game. And if Merom is able to defeat the national champion of Gunji, he will be the greatest strategy board game player in the country, as he would have beaten and subsequently killed every national champion. However, when he's introduced to the national champion of Gunji, he's surprised because it's a young blind girl by the name of Komogi. However, when she's ushered in, Meroem is still reading the rules of Gunji, but she keeps making noise while he's reading the book. And so he tells her if she keeps making noise, he'll kill her. At which point, Komogi closes her mouth, but since her nose is stuffed and perpetually runny, she passes out. This level of stupidity baffles Meroem, but he soon realizes that Komogi has a level of genius that even he will never be able to achieve. They play for eight hours straight, and Komogi wins every single game. However, after eight hours, Merom has deduced it'll only take four or five more games for him to learn her rhythm and disrupt it. And so he orders her to get rest while he goes and defeats the Go champion, who's been resting, claiming that he was tired and that's why he couldn't win against Merom. However, the idea of stopping playing Gunji is actually devastating to Komogi because she wants to continue playing. It's all she ever wants to do. However, luckily for Komogi, and not so luckily for the Go champion, and the Go champion, anticipating he was going to lose to Meroem and die, hung himself. So they get right back to playing. But even after these four or five games that Meroem believes should have been enough for him to master Komogi's rhythm and break it, he continues to lose with Komogi's moves becoming harder to read and sharper on the board. He gets to the point where he counts all 144 moves in a game and believes 
that she anticipated all 72 of the moves he made, which he believes should be impossible. It's not until Meruem comes up with a new strategy that he calls detached castling that he believes he has Komogi beat. As when he places his new Lieutenant General in the middle of the board, Komogi pauses. The first time she's done that in the 10 or so hours they've played. But the real reason that Komogi pauses isn't because she's about to lose. In fact, the next move she makes causes Meruem to concede defeat. But since Komogi knew how to beat him, why did she pause? Well, Komogi reveals to Meruem that it's actually not called detached castling. It's actually called Kokoriko. And Kokoriko is a strategy that Komogi herself created. Created. However, a year after its creation, somebody in a contest for Gunji used it against her, and she had to deduce a strategy against her own strategy. And as she explains this to him, she begins to cry because she felt as though watching Kokoriko get used in front of her was like watching her child be revived. But the only problem is she knew the next move she had to make to snuff out her child once again, which was incredibly painful for her. And while obviously this alone is an incredible moment of character development for Komogi, it also marks the longest Meruem has ever listened to a human talk. And it's the symbolic first step of Meruem not only understanding humans, but respecting them. But the sentimentality of this moment confuses Meruem, so he storms out, telling Komogi that she can have a break, but this will be the last. And as Meruem sits upon his throne and thinks about the games, he realizes that he's not disrupting her rhythm, She's disrupting his. However, these Gunji games, and more specifically, this rhythm is symbolic. Meruem's rhythm up to this moment was thinking of humans as livestock, brainless beings that needed to be placed on a short leash. And while he's trying to impart this rhythm onto Komogi, she disrupts it, as she is the physical representation of the fact that this rhythm, this ideology, is incorrect. Rather than getting upset about the fact that Komogi is disrupting his rhythm, he's amused by it, seeing it as an opportunity to grow. And what's interesting about this is that Meruem looks at this as an opportunity to grow his strategic thinking. But in reality, it's an opportunity to grow his empathy, his understanding of the humankind sitting across from him. But that growth hasn't necessarily happened yet. See, Meruem still believes in the ideology that might makes right, that only the strongest beings on earth should be in charge. And therefore, when he returns to the room where Komogi is sitting, sleeping in front of the Gunji board, waiting for him to come back, he attempts a psychological attack on Komogi in order to disrupt her rhythm, trying to attack what he believes are the two greatest weaknesses of humankind, greed and fear. You see, Meruem comes to Komogi and says, if you win this game, I'll give you anything you want, but if you lose, I'll take your left arm. To which Komogi responds, instead of my left arm, can you just take my head? Now Komogi is afraid that offering her life to the king would be offensive to him. As she states that once she loses, her life will be worthless and therefore offering that life to the king would be an offense to such a great being. The Komogi explains to Meruem her family situation and how she made a pact with herself that if she ever lost the game of Gunji, she would kill herself. You see what Komogi and a lot of watchers of Hunter x Hunter don't realize is that this is a Nen binding vow. Much in the same way that Gon made a binding vow with himself to take all of the power he would ever have in exchange for his life, Komogi offered up her life if she ever lost the Gunji game, which is why her Nen ability manifests at being incredible at Gunji. But Meruem is impressed by this, the dedication, the lack of fear. And in that moment, he realizes that not all humans are driven by fear. Some humans have passions that are so great that they push themselves beyond their own limitations and stake their own life to achieve what they want more than anything. But if Komogi doesn't have fear, surely she must have greed at least, which is why immediately after this, Meruem asks what she would want if she wins. To which Komogi responds with another answer that surprises him, saying that she only ever thinks about playing Gunji and that she would have to get back to him on that. See, Meruem anticipated that she would ask for his life or riches or to get out of this situation, but instead she was singularly focused on playing Gunji with the king. In fact, he brings up the idea that she could have asked for his life in exchange. However, simply the idea of it horrifies Komogi because she's simply looking forward to playing a game with him. And it's at this point that Meruem realizes that he was trying to use underhanded tactics to beat a human at their own game. He realizes that instead of going the long route and trying to simply outthink this human, he was trying to take a shortcut. He realizes and says, 
that he wasn't taking the game seriously. See, obviously, while trying to use humanity's worst traits against them is a might is right kind of way, at the same time, it's also one of the first acts of respect that Meruem had towards humans. He was trying to find a way out of playing Kamogi and Gunji. Well, obviously people focus significantly more on the fact that as an apology for not taking the game seriously, he tears off his own left arm, which is a very blatant act of respect. Honestly, I believe the fact that he was pushed into such a corner that he thought he should use underhanded tactics is a significantly larger event. But the sight of the king ripping off his own arm terrifies Shiba, who demands that Neferpito heal his arm. But Meruem stated that there would be no more breaks. And as he's about to kill Shiba for insubordination, Komogi steps in, stating that she will not play until he gets treatment. Even when he threatens to kill her, she doesn't budge. And eventually, he gives in to her stubbornness. In this moment, Meruem, the Ant King, who believed at one point he was the greatest being on Earth, is allowing himself Himself to be told what to do by a blind girl he's known for a day. And while a lot of people make the argument that Meruem didn't kill Kamogi because he was falling in love with her, I believe it's a lot closer to the fact that Meruem saw in Kamogi the first human he ever respected. Human who was teaching him more about what it meant to be human than he could learn in any book. And so Pito reattaches his arm and him and Kamogi play Gunji for three days straight until he realizes that Kamogi has reached her physical and mental limit and decides to break his own rule, allowing Kamogi to take a break. Now, this moment dies directly into the stripe that we see run directly through the entirety of Meruem's character development, pride. As Meruem decided he wouldn't be satisfied if he beat Kamogi in anything less than her tip-top shape. But in this moment, the pride has adjusted. See, this is no longer the pride of an arrogant and haughty man. This is sportsmanship, respect for your opponent. Marum is in essence saying that the only way that he could beat Kamogi is if she was mentally beyond her own limit, but beating her in that capacity wouldn't be worth it. See, somebody who was incredibly haughty and overly arrogant wouldn't stop to think about their opponent. They would take any victory so long as it came to them. And this is one of the biggest steps that Marum takes. And after Kamogi rests, they continue to play. And as Marum gets better at Gunji, so does Kamogi, until eventually she awakens to Nen. And as she awakens to Nen, she asks for the first break that she's ever asked for, which leads Meruem to ask why. More specifically, leads Meruem to ask, is anything wrong? See, in that moment, Meruem was concerned for her because he knew that she wasn't the kind of person who would try to back out of these games. He cared about her to the point where if there was something wrong, he wanted to fix it, but there was nothing wrong. She simply wanted to memorize the millions of different moves that were coming into her head now that she had awoken Net. Impressed by the fact that she hadn't forgotten a singular game she ever played, Meruem granted her request. Now, not only has he broken his rule, but he's allowed Kamogi to break his rule. As he's leaving, he asks her name, something he shouldn't care about. Kamogi is simply an ends to a means to make him a better strategic thinker. Much in the same way that you don't name a pig you're gonna turn into bacon, why would Meruem wanna know Kamogi on a more personal level? But even more importantly than the fact that Meruem is taking interest in Kamogi as a human is the fact that Kamogi responds by asking what his name is, something that had never even crossed his mind. This sends Meruem into a spiral as he meets with his royal guards and ascertains as to whether or not they think he has a name. They say he is king, which he responds is a title, not a name. And none of the royal guards can assuage his want for a name, with them all giving him answers that he's not satisfied with. Eventually, he tells the royal guards that he's seen Kamogi's body bathed in aura and states that she'll continually grow stronger, though not physically, but in Gunji. And it's at this point that he asks Pito if she'll survive the selection, to which Pito says, no, she's not physically strong. She won't be a good fighter. She's one of the most important moments in Hunter x Hunter. See, this singular moment makes Meruem realize that there are differing kinds of strength. While obviously brute force can rise to the top of the strength pyramid, Komogi's strength in Gunji is a strength as powerful as his brute strength, which makes Meruem reflect on all of his actions up to this point. But his journey is far from done. As, as he's reflecting upon his actions, he realizes that his brute force is greater than any other strength. And therefore he's committed to simply killing Kamogi. If she's not gonna make it through the selection, there's no need to have her around. And as he kicks in the room that Kamogi is currently sitting in, he realizes she's being attacked by a hawk. And without a moment's hesitation, he strikes the bird down. He, without thinking, yells at her for not calling out for help, as she's covered with scratches from this bird's attack, to which Kamogi replies that she didn't want to be an inconvenience, leading Meruem, without a second thought, to say, 
that she's an important guest. But this statement from his own mouth confuses him. He never meant to say it. He didn't believe he thought that. And it gets significantly worse when Komogi begins to cry. See, in this moment, Meruem realizes that the thoughts he had about his own actions actually had a significantly bigger weight on him than he had previously thought. See, in this moment, Meruem actually adopted a brand new philosophy, albeit subconsciously and absolutely on accident. In this moment, Meruem took his first step in the journey of realizing that those would brute force to protect those with other strengths. Marum then busts out of the room and orders Pito to watch over Komogi to make sure she's safe as he walks around the palace and contemplates why he exists. And caught in emotions as he's feeling for the first time ever tells all of the royal guards to stay away from him. However, on midnight of that night, Xenozoldic uses his dragon dive, which destroys the majority of the royal palace. In the first place that Marum goes after realizing they're under attack, Komogi's room, where he finds her mortally wounded. Now, this is actually the first time that Xenozoldic has ever injured an innocent person. And this moment is as formative for him as it is for Meruem. However, he immediately orders Pito to heal Komogi and asks Zeno and Netero to fight somewhere else so that she'll be safe. Do Meruem may be fighting with his conscious ideologies, his subconscious has already made the decision. He has respect and possibly love for Komogi. And no matter how much grappling he has to do with this idea, the fact that his body reacted the way that it did when the palace came under attack. It's a clear enough indication of it. And upon being relocated, Netero and Meruem begin to have a conversation, arguably my favorite conversation in anime ever. See, Meruem asked Netero why he would fight, even when Netero knew he would lose. He asked Netero if he was fighting for the entirety of humanity, and if so, Netero should know that all of Meruem's actions are for the benefit of humanity, claiming that his goal has now become the destruction of inequality in humankind. Talking about how humans have split up land with imaginary lines, where on one side of the line, people live lavish lives, while on the other, people live in abject poverty. And that Meruem, when in charge, would destroy these borders and create a world where inequality is a thing of the past. Now, Meruem admits that he would use power and terror in order to achieve these goals, but only when absolutely necessary, as Meruem has learned what true power is meant to be used for, to protect the weak who deserve to live. Now, obviously, Netero doesn't agree with this ideology, and they begin their battle. And over the course of this battle, once again, Meruem is intrigued by another human, as Netero, much like Komogi, is a human who broke through their limitations. Meruem takes thousands of strikes from Netero and only feels a dull pain. However, after taking thousands of strikes, Meruem is able to cut off Netero's leg, at which point he tells Netero to stop the bleeding and reveal his name. But Netero simply flexes his leg muscles and closes off the wound, which puts Meruem into a state of awe, seeing this human's dedication to defeating him. And they proceed along with their battle, with Meruem taking another couple thousands of strikes before he cuts off Netero's hand. And once again, Meruem sits down, telling Netero to tell him his name. At which point, Netero has one of the best lines in the entirety of Hunter x Hunter, saying, why do you assume I need hands? to pray and activates his zero hand on Meruem, which barely hurts him. Now, using the zero hand uses all of Netero's aura, which basically makes him the age that he actually is, roughly 150 years old. And after surviving the zero hand, Meruem once again demands that Netero tell him his name, at which point Netero delivers one of the greatest lines in the entirety of anime history, a line I have tattooed right here, but I'm wearing long sleeves. Never underestimate the bottomless malice within the human heart. And as Netero plunges a finger into his own heart, Meruem feels fear for the first time. And as Netero's heart stops, the poor man's rose on Netero's heart causes a nuclear explosion, which all but kills him. However, Yupi and Shiapu find his body and offer the majority of their bodies over to him to bring him back to life, which makes Meruem post-Rose Meruem and stronger than he's ever been in his entire life. However, post-Rose Meruem forgot basically everything about his short life, saying he recognized Shiapu and Yupi, but he felt as though he was missing something. And therefore, they were to head back to the palace in order to jog Meruem's memory. However, on the way back to the palace, it's revealed that Yupi is actually spared knuckle and more as well as Meliora and while Yubi believes that the king will kill him for this grave injustice Meruem simply states that the human aspects of their body taking one step further into the light is simply an evolutionary process telling Yubi that as they become more human and feel as though killing people who are defenseless is incorrect 
that makes them stronger as chimera ants and upon returning to the royal palace meroem is plagued with the idea he's missing something however the royal guards concerned that their king is becoming human and therefore won't move along with the selection or hiding Komogi from him it's not until he finds a chipped gunji piece the king piece the things start to come back to him. But it's not until Welfin, trying to save his own life, says the word Kamogi, that Meruem's memories come back to him. And in this moment, Meruem's headache subsides, and the intensity of his feelings towards Kamogi come back to him. At which point, Meruem deduces that Kamogi is underground. Thankful that Welfin brought his memories back, he releases Welfin, who yells out that my only king is Gyro. And while the old Meruem would have taken this as an offense, the new Meruem says, well, I hope you can find him and live a human life. It's at this point that Meruem goes to look for Kamog, and Palm is currently the person keeping her away from Meruem. However, Meruem knows that Palm is trying to keep Kamogi away from him, and so he calls out to the people keeping Kamogi away from him, saying that the war for humanity is over. I'm aware of my fate. He knew that the radiation of the poor man's rose was going to kill him, and that all he wanted to do was spend his final moments with Kamogi. Palm then reveals herself and tells Meruem where Kamogi is, so long as she can observe what he does with her ability, Wink Blue. And so Meruem flies to her location and wakes her up for a game of Gunji. Fortunately, there was a Gunji board in Bizev's bedroom, and they begin their game. But before they begin their game, Meruem reveals to Komogi his name, to which Komogi responds by reintroducing herself. And Meruem says, well, I already knew who you are, but I don't think before this moment I truly knew what was important. Oh, this is hard to get through. Meruem then demands that Komogi only call him by his name. And when he asks her what she would want if she was to win, all she says is another game. And Komogi opens with the Kokoriko. Because of this, Meruem feels offended. But what Meruem doesn't realize is that Komogi has made a defense to her own defense, creating a limitless range of new possibilities. And while Meruem reflects on how to battle against this infinite range of possibilities, Komogi begins to cry, stating that she's unworthy of this level of happiness, as all she had ever wanted in her entire life was to play Gunji with people good enough to keep her entertained. It's at this point that Meruem confesses that he's been poisoned, and that this poison is contagious and that the only thing he wanted at the end of his life was to play Gunji with her, and that if she wants to live, she should leave. But without a word, she just counters his move, implying that she wanted to be there with him, regardless if it meant she would live or die. And it's at that point that Meruem realizes that he was never born to take over humanity. He wasn't born to protect the weak. He was born for that moment right there. He was born to experience the true love that he made through a human connection with Kamogi. I'm dying! And after a while, Meruem eventually goes blind, but he keeps asking if Kamogi is there, which she always answers yes. And eventually Meruem notes that he was never able to defeat Kamogi, and after a while he states he feels tired. So he asks Kamogi to hold his hand while he sleeps, and asks if she'll still be by his side when he wakes up, to which Kamogi responds by saying that she'll never leave him. He asks Kamogi to say his name one last time before he goes to sleep, and she does. And they die together with their two pieces, the king and the knight placed next to each other. You see, Meruem was more than the ideology of absolving borders. He was more than the idea of the strong protecting the weak. See, people believe that the pinnacle of Meruem's character development happened in his battle against Netero, when he claimed that even though he would use terror and power, he would usher humanity into an era where inequality no longer existed. And because of that, some people sympathize with that ideology. Some people believe that Meruem in that moment was correct and that he should have been in charge, that the means would have justified the ends. But that's not what Meruem's character meant. The surface level of Meruem's character was to show a monster becoming a human. A person who thought that might could fix any problem, realizing that might should be used sparingly and to protect those that matter to you. But that's not where Meruem's character development ended. The true purpose behind Meruem's character is to display to you that regardless of what your strengths are, be they brute, brawn, or intelligence, were put on this earth to connect to each other. See, Komogi stands for a lot more than just somebody who's meant to be protected. Komogi is meant to display that purpose is driven through other people, and that when you find connection through other people, strength no longer matters. Meruem is the perfect encapsulation of the death of ego, that in this life there is nothing better or more human than weakness. The weakness we get to experience when we feel comfort with the people we love most. The lesson of Meruem is not some dictatorial take on how to rule the world. The lesson of Meruem is that it doesn't matter how you're born, you're worthy of love. But not until you make that realization yourself will you ever get it. This tattoo 
covers both physical and emotional scar. And honestly, without this scene, I don't know if I, I don't know if I would be sitting here. So look deeper into the story of Meruem and realize that he's telling us that it doesn't matter the life you've lived. Once you realize that you're worthy of love and you let love into your life, that's the moment you truly become human. And that's why forever and always, he will be my favorite anime character. And I hope now that you better understand him as a character, he might be yours now. I have nothing else witty to say. Just like the video, subscribe to the page, and hit the notification. You're wanted here.